It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's discussion entitled, Who is Winning the Childhood Obesity Battle? Uh, the Fort Hall Forum is proud to be the nation's oldest continuously operating free public lecture series. And we thank you for participating in the century-old program to advance freedom of speech and inform citizenry through public discussion. Uh, we appreciate our generous sponsors in the Boston community and beyond, including, among others, the Lowell Institute, uh, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and our partners at Suffolk University, which serves as the forum's home base. We also thank our members whose generosity makes this public event uh, free to all. If you're not a member, uh, feel free to visit our information booth as you leave and sign up for membership. It's your support that keeps the forum alive and free. Uh, this event, like all of our programs, is being recorded and will be available as a webcast on the WGBH Forum Network. If you're sharing a comment or a question, please walk right up to the microphone and speak into the, the microphones there and right there so that uh, we can hear you, but also so that we can capture it on video. If you do speak, uh, you are giving us your permission to record you. Uh, and of course, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Christina Konomos. Uh, Dr. Konomos is the Associate Director of the John Hancock Research Center on Physical Activity, Nutrition, and Obesity Prevention. She is the New Balance Chair in Childhood Nutrition, and she's an Associate Professor at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition uh, and Tufts School of Medicine. She has received a Bachelor's of Science from Boston University, a Master's of Science in Applied Psychology, I'm sorry, Physiology and Nutrition from Col Columbia University, and a Doctorate in Nutrition Science from Tufts University. Uh, Dr. Konamos's research efforts have addressed the interaction between exercise, diet, body composition, bone health, and the built environment aimed at preventing osteoporosis and obesity starting in early childhood. She is the principal investigator of multiple large-scale studies examining childhood nutrition and physical activity with the goal of inspiring behavior, policy, and environmental change to improve the health of America's children. She has worked effectively with diverse communities and has crafted, implemented, and evaluated a physical activity and nutrition education curriculum. Dr. Economos's work it engages theory and scientific evidence as vehicles to spark systemic, community-based change. Uh, I hope you will give her a big hand and welcome our moderator, Christina Economos. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Welcome to the forum. I'll be serving as moderator tonight and introducing our four distinguished guests uh, one by one so they can share with you their thoughts on the topic and um, offer some information that you can react to and hopefully we can all engage in an active dialogue around this. So before I introduce our first speaker, just uh, as an opening remark, I'm sure you're all aware that we have a childhood obesity epidemic on our hands in the United States. The prevalence of childhood obesity has tripled in America over the past several decades. And we now have about one third of American children who are overweight or obese. And there are disparities when we look at this prevalence across different communities. So in disadvantaged communities, that prevalence can be as high as 50% if you work in inner city or rural communities with disadvantaged children. And uh, most of us working in this area are really looking at this from a broad perspective. We're engaged in this as a complex problem that requires forward thinking and complex solutions to actually turn this tide on childhood obesity. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker to the podium, Dr. Dong Chul Xiao, who is an associate professor in the Department of Applied Health Science at Indiana University. And his current research interests include policy and socio-ecological approaches in obesity prevention. He's authored or co-authored 48 articles in peer-reviewed journals, including the American Journal of Public Health and many more. He's been the principal investigator on a number of grants from the federal or state government, and he served as a grant reviewer for a number of agencies, including the National Science Foundation. He's a board member of the American Academy of Health Behavior and also an award-winning master teacher receiving the Indiana University Trustees Teaching Award four times. Please welcome Dr. Dong Chal Sio.
Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Economist, uh, and thank you very much for coming today. Well, uh, as Dr. Economist just uh, briefly mentioned, in the past few decades, childhood obesity in the United States has more than tripled. It has risen from 5% in 1971 to 17% in 2008. As a result, uh, as you may know, many researchers have explored what has caused it. While conclusions vary to some extent, most studies agree that there is no single cause. Childhood obesity tends to stem from complex interactions between child's genetic background, behavior, family, community, society, and demographic characteristics. As indicated by Davison and Birch's ecological model of uh, predictors of childhood obesity, even though child's weight status is influenced by his or her individual intake and expenditure patterns, those patterns are shaped by factors beyond the individual. Many conditions in the modern food environment compromise the delicate biological and psychological regulatory systems that govern eating and body weight. Examples of such conditions include the increasing amounts of sugar and fat in foods in general and rising portion size as noted by Dr. Schwartz, one of our guests and her colleagues. Yet until recently, the vast majority of approaches to obesity in America have focused largely on the individual and that general strategy has only produced slight or a short-term impact, if any. This individualistic approach or personal responsibility attribution appears to be one of the main culprits for the persistence of the childhood obesity epidemic. The personal responsibility approach can cause numerous negative effects such as diminished self-esteem, aggravated eating disorders, stigmatization of obese children, and further marginalization of obese children from backgrounds of lower socioeconomic status. Given that uh, children have much less control over what they are exposed to, if we fail to make healthy options the standard for them, or uh, default choices, if you will, we may be held responsible for this epidemic and the severely declining health of our children. Their levels of physical activity call for consideration as well. Two thirds of American youth aged six to 19 years do not practice the recommended level of daily physical activity. And physical activity levels decrease by more than one third between the ages of nine and 15. And in 2006, only 3% of high schools provide the physical education at least three days a week. We need to take collective responsibility for the state of our children's health and consistently implement bold actions to make healthier food choices the norm and motivate our children to be more physically active. For example, we can eliminate children's exposure to food advertising on television like they have successfully done in Norway and Sweden. And increase tax on sugar-sweetened beverage and mandate that all schools provide physical education a minimum of three days a week. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to ask Dr. Marlene Schwartz to come to the podium. Dr. Schwartz serves as Deputy Director of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity at Yale University. She received a BA from Haverford College and an MS and PhD in Psychology from Yale. Dr. Schwartz completed her clinical internship at the Yale Medical School and postdoctoral training in the Yale Department of Psychology. Dr. Schwartz's research is focused on how home environments, communities, and school landscapes shape the eating attitudes and behaviors of children. 
She frequently collaborates on state projects with the Connecticut State Department of Education, including a large research study funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Healthy Eating Research Program. Dr. Schwartz was also the recipient of a transition grant from Robert Wood Johnson in 2008 to create a website based on the school wellness policy coding system that she developed with national colleagues. Please welcome Dr. Schwartz to the podium. Thank you very much. Um, well, the position of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity, where I work, is very consistent with what you just heard. We really look not just at the individual, but at the environment that the individual lives in and all of the things that influence our eating decisions, our eating behaviors, and physical activity. So what I wanted to share today, actually, was, is some work we're doing at the Rudd Center on food marketing to children. And I can tell you exactly when I got interested in food marketing to children. It was at a grocery store visit. I was there with my then three-year-old, and we were standing in the aisle where they sell, right, the granola bars and the fruit roll-ups and things like that. And I was looking at something else, and suddenly she put her hand on a box that had Disney princesses on it. And she said, Mommy, Mommy, I want this, I want this. And I said, okay, Anna, what is it? She said, I don't know. <laughs> and so it was really an interesting example to me of how at, at three, she knew she wanted it. Interestingly, she could reach it. And also that it didn't matter to her what was actually in the box. So we um, got a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to do a three-year study to look in depth at food marketing to children. And each year, we're looking at a different food type. So last year, we looked at cereal. And I just want to share some of the things we found. Basically, we took all of the cereals created by Kellogg's, General Mills, Post, and Quaker. We uh, looked at the nutritional information, and we coded them using sort of a nutrition rating scale. We then purchased data from Nielsen to see the amount of exposure children and adults had to the marketing for those specific cereal brands. And then we kind of looked at those two indices next to each other. And essentially, there was a perfect negative correlation in that the more a child saw a brand of cereal, the worse the nutritional value of that cereal. And it became very clear to us that these companies all had healthy cereals, but those were not the ones that they were marketing to kids. So we presented those data um, last year at a conference and were able to get some attention to the issue. And in terms of um, consequences, I would say that it has had some positive consequences. Now, I don't necessarily think that our study alone did this, but it's interesting to note um, that General Mills came out and said that they were going to reduce the amount of sugar in their children's cereal down to single digits. Um, and other companies seem to be following suit in terms of decreasing the amount of sugar they put in products. Um, another example is the milk processors are trying to decrease the amount of sugar they have in chocolate milk because they've been getting a lot of attacks from people who are concerned about chocolate milk. So I think that the food industry is reacting. I think we don't, we don't want to let up the pressure. I think there still needs to be quite a bit of pressure on the industry to keep up these changes, but I think that we have made some progress. Um, at the same time, the industry has a self-regulation um, sort of program called the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative where they say that they're going to self-regulate their marketing to kids. But when you look carefully at the criteria that they use, they have pretty loose uh, criteria for better for you kids, better for you foods, and they also have pretty loose criteria for marketing to children. A lot of the things that they do, such as having websites that are directed at kids um, and other social media and digital media, don't fall under this particular, you know, what they consider marketing to children. Marketing they do in schools doesn't count. Um, so I think we need to really keep an eye on that. Um, but the good news is um, I think that the, the awareness of the problem of marketing to children has been raised, and I think that the industry is getting the message loud and clear, and I think the more they hear from parents um, that they will continue to make those changes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Frank Robinson who is a public health professional with more than 30 years of experience working in community health education and has served as executive director for Partners for a Healthier Community for the past 13 years. Under Frank's leadership, PHC has become a preeminent public health promotion organization in Western Massachusetts and well regarded as a community nonprofit incubator and capacity building organization. 
Before joining PHC, Dr. Robinson worked for four years as director of the City of Springfield's Community Partnership Grant for Substance Abuse Prevention. Earlier in his career, he directed the development of local and regional systems operated by the De Massachusetts Department of Mental Health and Ohio Department of Mental Retardation and Developmental Disabilities. Dr. Robinson has a master's degree in community psychology from Mansfield University and a doctorate in public health from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Please welcome Dr. Robinson. Good evening. Good evening. So um, uh, Dr. Ricardo suggested that we do something to try and spice up the presentation. So I'm going to um, uh, throw a curve or two because my approach to this topic is going to be a little bit different from the two previous speakers. I consider myself translational in the work that I do. The um, research and the evidence that's emerging needs to get translated into practice in the community so that we can actually change communities, create healthier communities, and that's the business I'm in. So I'm going to uh, take it from that end. And I'm going to begin by changing the title. Um, and the title begins, Who is Winning the Child Obesity Battle? And I've changed it to Gearing Up for the War on, Ch on Obesity. And so the notion of this battle stuff, um, I'm watching television the other day, and a unit commander in Afghanistan is asked by a reporter um, if he was winning the war. The unit commander used his success in his battle area to say, well, I control about 10 miles of territory, and every day I fight and I win, and I maintain control over my portion of the battlefield. But my sector in responsibility is really about 100 miles, square miles. So in effect, I'm winning about 10% of the war in my particular sector. And he suggests that the basic structure and systems that supports the opposition that sends the folks over the hill to shoot at him uh, haven't been touched. Now, he doesn't quite say that. He, he suggests that my counterparts control their small pieces of the battlefield and they're winning their individual battles. Uh, that the structure of the war in Afghanistan, and he didn't say it, but you could sort of read between the lines, was such that um, the battles w were being won, but the war in some ways uh, may be uh, lost. So that's, that's the framework I'm coming from, that we it's not a battle, it's a war, and we haven't quite geared up for the, the war. Uh, so if I look at the Springfield Republican about, oh, a couple weeks ago, they have this banner headlines, children's weight issue presents challenge. And um, they begin by offering the statement, too much mass, not enough motion. That's the conclusion of the new State Department of Public Health survey on childhood obesity, which found that more than one third of the students in 80 school districts were overweight with even higher levels in Springfield, Holyoke, and Chicopee. And so my context for this presentation is really talking about, talking about Springfield. So when you look at Springfield um, against the uh, state averages, we may have something like 44% um, of the children in grades one, four, seven, and 10, when they sort of averaged that, were, were obese. Um, and what's impressive, not impressive, what's uh, challenging is that you don't get to first grade with a problem in weight uh, automatically. Particularly, well, let, let's just hold that. Um, so let me sort of frame a couple more points. Do you know uh, that uh, these children of Springfield live in one of the most residentially segregated cities in the nation? Do you know that the schools are the, amongst the most racially segregated schools in the state? Do you know that the poverty rate in Springfield is three times the uh, state rate and that some neighborhoods have as many as 70% of children under five living at or below poverty? Do you know that children in Springfield are in the lead on too many negative health indicators, asthma, lead exposure, environmental hazards, teen pregnancy, obesity? Do you know that poverty, environmental hazards, health disparities, and equity, spatial segregation are all concentrated in the same neighborhoods? And in those same neighborhoods, they lack a full line grocery store. And then when you assess those neighborhoods, those neighborhoods rank highest in uh, issues of food insecurity. So the challenge is that there's this imbalance. And so you know the, the energy in, energy out balance, seesaw? Well, instead of putting stuff on it, we put systems on it. Built systems, food systems. And if we can get those systems to act right, 
if you can get the systems to wrap, wrap around children in a way that protects and nurtures children, then we might get some, some results. So our work is really about changing systems so that they wrap around children. You hear this comments, how effective it is when you wrap services around kids. You wrap these wrap around services, they make a difference. We're talking about changing systems so the systems wrap around uh, children. And in that particular, how do we uh, change our built systems, food systems, so that they do that work. The other part of the model that's missing, so we're, we got the systems we're changing. Well, there's a missing ingredient. So if you go back and revisit my comments, my do you know questions about Springfield, there is a third element, and it sits up in top, and it sort of interacts with both systems. It's called racism. So those same communities without a grocery store happen to be the same communities that are most racially segregated with schools are most segregated where there is uh, uh, less resources. So again, so in our model, as we do this work in Springfield, we, we are looking at systems, we, including those systems that uh, perpetuate and or uh, foster uh, racism. We think that's a root problem to the issue of obesity. If not obesity, asthma. If not asthma, car uh, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera. Because when you look at health outcomes in those same neighborhoods that I just uh, went through, those neighborhoods have humongous uh, disparities or inequities. The bottom line is there really isn't a silver bullet solution. Uh, the silver bullet um, solution doesn't exist. We've already heard it's complex, it's multi-layered, it requires working in many, many different systems at the same time. So we have, um, and I'm gonna end on this and, and, and um, get out of the way for the next presenter. We have an, an initiative, and we have multiple initiatives. We're working with uh, food policy councils, we're working with our planning department around complete streets and zoning ordinances, we're working with um, ourselves around how do we evaluate and assess this work and translate evidence into practice. But we have a specific intervention because we don't think that we can do really good policy work without tying it to a concrete intervention. It's called Farm to Preschool and Families. And within that particular intervention, we are trying to get local farmers to put um, fresh produce in preschools uh, and change the way that the preschool environment uh, serves and nurtures and grows our children. Because those children in preschool show up in, in first grade. If they leave preschool with a weight problem, they show up in first grade with a weight problem. So there are very few initiatives, to my knowledge in this state, that are geared up with a specific and targeted focus on children, uh, growing them up right within their child care system. So our target for change is our early education and care department, our Springfield Public Health Schools uh, system, uh, and our food system is how do we get food into those schools in a way that is uh, helpful. Add to that the other initiatives around physical activity, built environment, and on and on and on. So I'm gonna stop at that point because I can go on forever, and I know I only had five minutes, it's probably going beyond it. But uh, I wanna suggest that our challenge is, uh, our framework is incomplete. It needs to be a health equity framework. We need to add that dimension of racism to it. And we need to be working around systems, wrapping systems around kids, not services. Great, thank you very much. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Karen Bosi to the podium. Karen is the Executive Director of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation. She most recently served as Senior Vice President for a program for the Rhode Island Foundation, one of the nation's largest community foundations where she worked for more than 16 years. Prior to that, she directed community school programs in Jamaica Plain in Dorchester, led the United Nations International Year of the Child Observance for the state of Massachusetts, and headed the capital campaign for the Williamstown Regional Art Conservation Laboratory. She holds degrees in sociology from Simmons College and American University, and she has served as an elected representative to the school committee of East Greenwich, Rhode Island. Please welcome Karen to the podium. Good evening. Could I just get a little sense of who's in the audience? Are you, uh, uh, teachers, school teachers here? Uh, Okay, public school teachers, uh, students in uh, health, health communications, 
law, um, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. <laughs> um, I think, uh, as you could tell from my bio, um, and I'm really pleased to be here with these um, very esteemed colleagues, I am not uh, a healthcare professional. The people on the podium you've heard from are uh, content producers. They're doing the research. They're really doing the, the harder work, and Frank is doing some amazing community work from a health perspective and from a community perspective. And my job is really to look at how philanthropy can be engaged in creating a movement um, that provides uh, environments for kids to eat better and move more, kids and families. And our board made a decision three years ago that they were going to focus on this particular topic almost exclusively in terms of their giving. We're small, a uh, small foundation in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. So we bring a regional perspective to this, but we also bring um, a perspective that really uh, dovetails with what you've heard, that, you know, that this is a, an environmental issue. This is not about putting children on diets or, uh, or it's not a treatment protocol. It's not about sending kids off to camp for the summer and you know, hope that they lose weight. This is really about a culture that we have built in this country and in this society um, for all the right reasons. We don't believe there are any bad guys here. You know, we all wanted our children to, to have plentiful food. We wanted them to have comfortable houses. We wanted them to be in school. We didn't want them to be in factories or mines. I mean, this culture, since the end of World War II, has really provided the economic resources and the um, particular um, economic philosophy of the marketplace that has sort of combined to create this. Um, I think it's something that uh, I learned from Chris Economos, an obesogenic environment. Um, and so our, our work here is really to not just figure out how we got here, but to use whatever philanthropic resources we have to, com to create a movement that will in effect take it apart, to peel it back and recreate um, some of the things that many of us knew as kids and, um, and that we would hope perhaps would allow for healthier um, opportunities for our kids. So what do we do? Um, we do make grants, um, but we also bring constituencies together. We say we do three things. We provide information, we provide uh, data from all of the work that you've heard from. We provide that um, out to uh, about 3,000 teachers, community officials, recreation people throughout the, the, that tri-state region, as we say. We also bring leaders together to educate them on this topic and, and as importantly to educate them that everyone has a role to play here. If we're going to uh, create these environments, it's not just going to be driven by the health industry or physicians or even researchers. We need smart growth people, transportation people, agriculture, city planners. We need mayors. We need school committee people. We need school uh, administrators. We need all of those people sitting around the table working the problem from the perspective of not necessarily what your budget requires or what your um, particular calendar is for making decisions, but what's best for kids and families in this community. And so where you cite a school and what you, and, and how you con configure pathways and whether you have sidewalks or lights, or as Frank pointed out critically, where you cite markets or where you don't cite markets or where zoning allows for more fast food opportunities, that, that's where the rubber hits the road here. And uh, lots of people don't clearly understand that that role is critically important here. And on top of that, we are funding three major initiatives in each of the three states, which demonstrate what change looks like, which are sustainable, environmental, so when the money goes away, the habits and the changes are there, and which show policymakers what uh, change looks like. And we fund advocacy. There's not a lot of advocacy on this topic. Um, when you look around and you look at where child health advocates are putting their firepower these days, uh, a lot of it has been with health reform, and rightly so. But from my perspective, I think they're missing from the field in this, uh, in this opportunity. And um, if there's anyone listening from the Annie Casey Foundation, I think your Kids Count Network needs to be in this. Um, so finally, um, I want to leave you with one small thought about the notion of individual responsibility, because we know it's not about kids, 
but every single person in this room who spends time with children needs to be sure that when they spend that time, it's very important that you look at the lens through healthy food and movement in a way that you're not just saying, well, you know, if the school can't do this, well, it doesn't make any difference if I take a walk or if I serve dinner at home or if I lobby to do uh, something that makes more fresh food available in schools. Everything you do counts, and everything you do is important to creating this movement. Uh, we also would say to you as a consumer, it is really important for you to buy locally, to, do, uh, to, to pay attention to what the vendors that you work with, where you buy your groceries, um, where you buy stuff in your community, and finally, as a citizen, um, it is incredibly important for you not just to be there around some of the very important things that Frank talked about, but again, and I know he was going to get to this because we were talking about it before, he's sitting with planners now to talk about you know, lighting and sidewalks. I mean, when those topics come up, when there's a zoning hearing, that's where you need to be standing up and talking about um, how important it is for kids and families to have opportunities to have an environment where they can eat better and move more. Um, so we are trying to get the word out. We're trying to convene leaders and also providing support to those particular um, spark plugs, as Chris would say, in communities that really demonstrate that what individual people do matters a lot, but it also matters how they see their roles as activist, consumer, um, educated parent, teacher, administrator, after school program director, and, um, and most important, voting citizens. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. The comments were excellent. And I just want to try to tie them together for us and then open it up so we can entertain questions from all of you. I think what you heard hopefully convinces you that this is about social change. This isn't an individual problem that we can deal with in a clinical setting, but it's about moving our society to a different place. And it will take decades. It took decades to get us here. And if we're serious about reversing this, it will take decades to get us out of it. And what we haven't talked about tonight are the consequences of a child being overweight. And if you've been listening over the past five to 10 years to reports coming out, you know that there's a shorter life expectancy, the risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression, sleep apnea, orthopedic problems, all increases starting at a very young age when a child presents as overweight. And over the past couple of years, there have been reports on the economic consequences, decreased work productivity, and the ability of our military to be ready or even to accept recruits. So we have a big problem on our hands as a society. And if a child becomes overweight in their early years and reaches the adolescent period and presents as overweight, the likelihood of them remaining overweight is extremely high. So we have to prevent it from happening. We can't rely on a healthcare system to treat it once it happens. So <clears throat> we need to take an interdisciplinary approach to solve this problem. And you've heard from diverse speakers tonight coming from different disciplines. They were trained with different degrees. They're now focusing on different things. And it's really the work, the collective work of all of us that will move the needle. And it's an interdisciplinary approach. So for those of you who are students, as you go out in the world and work on complex problems, it will require collaboration amongst different disciplines. So I'd like to uh, kick it off with a couple of questions that I've been thinking about as people have been talking and, and see if our speakers could weigh in a little bit. And the first one is really about the energy balance equation, which was brought up already, because it really is energy balance. It's energy in and energy out that we have to be thinking about on a daily basis, and that's in the form of calories. And we look to the food we consume and the activity that we do to balance us on a daily basis. I'd like to hear from everyone what they think about the contribution. Is it predominantly calories in? Is it predominantly a lack of calories out? Is it truly a balance? Does that differ within different groups, demographic groups? But I'd love to hear a couple of comments on that. Well. Uh, I did uh, some uh, meta-analysis of, uh, of these interventions. Mm -hmm. And what I found was uh, in line with uh, the comments made by uh, the, uh, the David Kessler 
uh, who was former FDA commissioner. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the more problem lies in the excess eating, so more uh, you know, intake rather than lack of uh, expenditure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would have to agree. I really do think that um, the food side of the equation is a bigger part of both what caused this in the first place and I think what we're going to need to focus on in order to make the changes. And I mean, one way that I think people can understand that is that it takes you about you know, 30 seconds to eat 100 calories. Um, and if you've ever been on one of those treadmills that gives you the calories as you're going, it takes a really long time for that to get up to 100 <laughs> calories. So I just think that, um, you know, the speed with which we can overconsume is frightening. And I think that's where we really need to put on the brakes. So what you consume as well. So if you live in um, Center City, Springfield, and you don't have a supermarket, and you shop at the corner store, the bodega, um, uh, you don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, and if the program located in that community that's providing the preschool program uh, or the school program serves you crap, um, so then, yeah, this is what you eat, and, um, and it's hard to get it off, but if you don't even have the choice for fresh, nutritious fruits and vegetables, uh, and you're hungry, you eat what's available. So just to follow up on that, uh, a couple of days ago, there was a study released looking at a national data set that we rely on in this country called NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And the most recent data shows that children are consuming 40% of their calories from added sugar and solid fat. And you all know what the pyramid is. It's been changed over the years, and it's due to be changed again. But you know that most of our food should be coming from the food groups of fruits and vegetables and grains and low-fat dairy and lean meats and other um, vegetarian protein sources. And a little bit of discretionary calories in the form of sugar and fat should be allowed in per day, maybe a couple hundred. And we're seeing 40% from a child consuming maybe 1,800 to 2,000 calories per day. And a lot of it is because what they have access to. So it's not because they're going in a grocery store that is rich with produce and only deciding to buy foods that are being marketed to them. That's a piece of it. But it's also if you live in a food desert and you're shopping at a bodega or you're relying on school food or after school snacks, it's probably highly processed and also being heavily marketed to you. So that's astounding to look at those data and see that that's what our children are eating in America. I guess I would like to add that that's why um, that we're focusing on children ages 6 to 12, and most of those children, probably 80% of them, are in school and, uh, and usually in after-school child care, which means they're spending most of their day um, in some form of group activity or setting. And that's why it's so critically important that what we feed children in schools is it really, really matters. And people who sort of in schools who throw up their hands and uh, say, well, you know, we just have to feed them what they want to eat or what the government gives us, um, are really not paying attention to some of the trends and some of the leaders in some schools um, in this region about how they're managing to make that work. We've actually got a study coming out soon that Chris's team has done um, on some individuals from not the richest school districts who are really uh, making a critical difference in the quality of that food. We're also working with boys and girls clubs around dinner that they're getting. So kids are eating sometimes three meals a day, not at home. And particularly given some of the things that Frank's pointed out, it's very important that they have um, the best possible food in those settings. Great. Would anyone like to come up to the microphone? I have lots of questions if you don't, but I'd love to hear from you. And I'm a retired principal and in Boston, and my school had 850 children, a school lunch program because we were so, 94% of mm -hmm. the children mm -hmm. received free lunch. Mm -hmm. I would see horrible meals. Now that's changing. Yeah. However, I would go out of my mind. Breakfast would be, now I had a large African American and Hispanic population. The Hispanic kids did not want the food, nor did the Asian kids. 
it was so bad that the food would all be wasted and thrown in the barrel, or the children who were so poor would put it in their lunch baskets. Um, lunch, and this hasn't changed very much. I've talked to my colleagues. I've only been out four years. And lunch would be pizza a lot. The kids love that. The other thing, I also worked at a Japanese school. And the difference was this. The Japanese school had incredibly healthy food. They contracted it out. Mm -hmm. The children also were responsible for cleaning up the cafeteria, for taking care of things, and for sometimes there was a cooking area to make their own food. But it was so healthy. And when I looked at my public school, and I could almost cry, because the children also were rushed through their meals. It's another part of eating. Mm -hmm. You had 20 minutes to eat your meal. You were rushed in and rushed out. At the Japanese school, you had an hour. I, I just recently visited um, a small school in, in Italy, and they had almost an hour as well, and they actually had multiple courses, and yeah. they also ate on real plates, and it was so civilized, and the children did also participate in serving and clearing, and it was just an incredible experience, and our children wouldn't believe that if we showed it to them, because it is often 10 to 12 minutes that they're actually in, engaged, and it's very difficult. I think there are improvements, but I think, as you said, it hasn't changed that much. Uh, I'd love to open it up to some school food discussion. Sure, I just wanted to, you know, add a couple things to that. I mean, this the cafeteria food um, in many schools, there are really two parts to it. There's the national school lunch, which does have some regulations, maybe not as strong as we would like, but there are rules about what counts as a school lunch. And then there's this whole category of competitive foods, which are all of the other foods that are sold outside the school lunch program, which tend to be the ice cream and the chips and the, the you know, things we think of as junk food. And there's been a lot of effort, I know here in Massachusetts, um, recently some success in terms of state setting standards for what those competitive foods can be. Where I'm from in Connecticut, we have state standards um, that school districts can either um, agree to participate in and get extra funding from the state or not participate in. Well, we did a study where we looked at those districts that agreed to participate and had taken out the unhealthy a la carte and, and competitive foods. And what we found was that participation in the regular school lunch program went up. So it was almost as though when the kids um, didn't have access to the unhealthy snacks, they were sort of like, oh, forget it. I'm not going to eat, you know, the baked potato chips or whatever it was that, you know, sort of met the standards. They went ahead and got the school lunch, which financially, which is the other thing we haven't actually focused on, is there's massive financial factor here that the healthier foods that we want everyone to be eating are more expensive than the things you can get at the corner store. And so with food service, often you have tremendous financial pressure on the food service to cover their expenses, and so that's why they've become so dependent on these competitive foods. So one, if we can convince people that if you get rid of them, your participation will go up, and you can really focus then on the quality of your school lunch, I think that'll help move things forward. And fortunately, we have um, at the Institute of Medicine in the U.S. Um, bodies of experts that are convened on a regular basis to put out guidelines and recommendations, and and just this past spring, they released a report on standards for school food, not the competitive foods, but the school lunch. The unfortunate part is to actually implement those, it's going to cost this country so much money that I don't know if it'll happen. So the question is, what are we prioritizing? Mm -hmm. Do we not care what kids are eating? We were willing to put laws on whether or not children could access tobacco products or whether or not they had to wear a seatbelt or be in a car seat and be restrained. But we're not willing to put the same kind of effort into helping them consume healthy foods and be active. And I think it's a question we have to ask ourselves as adults in this society, what is important to us? And how hard are we going to fight to make change? Can I add, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Schwartz that uh, financial reasons are one of the reasons, uh, I mean, one of the barriers. But at the same time, I think it has to do with culture. In Asian countries like you know, Japan, Korea, China, uh, all the kids have at least 50 minutes to one hour for lunch. And then uh, and also, you know, uh, they, uh, uh, as you know, she already indicated, uh, they really uh, are given healthy choices. 
and also even though I said uh, you know from the research uh, excess calorie intake is much more uh, important culprit than a uh, lack of uh, expenditure, energy expenditure in terms of contribution to obesity, we should not overlook the lack of uh, physical activity and increasing sedentary lifestyles. For example, Americans just on the average uh, you know, take 5,001 steps a day know just walk 5001 steps a day but you know for uh, many Europeans they walk you know, more than 9000 steps and you know, some asian countries you know more than 10000 steps mm -hmm. and you know we you know dr we love drive through but you know at the same time you know we don't want to walk even you know 5 minutes walk you know we, we don't we don't want to do that you know i mean you know lots of americans do so uh, we also needed to uh, take a look at that uh, from the, you know, that kind of you know cultural uh, perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have another question? Yes, please. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'll try to be brief, and I will probably fail. Uh, my name is Mike Prager, and uh, I'm a journalist and an author. In two weeks, I'm releasing a book called Fat Boy Thin Man, uh, which argues for the existence of uh, food addiction, and uh, I. Uh, bolster my arguments with uh, personal experience. I used to weigh 365 pounds and I've been in a normal sized body for 20 years. Um, I'd like to hear the panel talk about um, the political part of it. Uh, last week or the week before, uh, Glenn Beck was at a um, event in Illinois and said, uh, Mrs. Obama, keep your hands off my french fries. And it, it is, uh, I've written in uh, the Globe and other periodicals about uh, my issue, and uh, it amazes me the vitriol that the uh, co uh, chat room commenters, which you know isn't that surprising, but uh, have for the idea that uh, you know one of the things that uh, I thought we might hear about tonight was the uh, soda tax, and mm -hmm. there is so many. Uh, it has become very much a political issue, and uh, it is a liberal somehow a liberal versus conservative issue. Mm -hmm. And my biggest question for those who say keep your hands off my French fries, what is your solution? We have a problem. What are you going to do? What What are we going to do about it? But I find them to be some of the most formidable barriers: uh, subsidies for corn, etc. Uh, thanks. I think this is that's the, the the toughest part of this, and I would um, and I would say that that is probably the next wave of 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 what could be coming. I don't think um, we're seeing. Um, so the generation of children now that are in elementary school and high school, I think we're sort of just at the tip of how um, problematic it's going to be for those children in the next 10 years. And I do think, um, and I'm not speaking for the foundation or Harvard Pilgrim, but it's my sense that as movements develop, there'll be a much higher, and we have more data specifically linking certain foods to certain, uh, uh, we have it now, but I guess I'm saying that, you know, it's, it's still not the, nicotine tobacco argument. But I, I do think that's coming. I w and and I, I think given the costs that we will all have to bear uh, around the chronic disease that we will be seeing, and not just from children, but just if you look around at some of the baby boomers, um, what could be coming, I think it's a fair discussion in a democratic society to say um, how do we handle that. And I would say that there'll probably be um, some court issues as well as uh, trying to look at this from a legislative perspective. Um, and I think it's, um, again, not necessarily um, inappropriate to ask the question about whose hands get to go on the french fries depending on who's paying for what happens to them after they eat too many of them. So I think we're still not quite there yet. I mean, it's not necessarily easy. I don't see people looking at parents who are allowing children to have three giant plates of french fries in a restaurant. I don't see them walking up to them and saying, you know, that's really not a good thing, you shouldn't do that. But if those children were smoking, they certainly would go up and do that. So I, I just think it's, it's, it's not, we're not there yet. I, I'd, I'd add that it's um, small p, big p political. So imagine this. Uh, you have parents, um, families, neighborhoods organize around the crap that the kids eat at school. Um, Springfield has uh, 10 level, level 4 schools. I was talking to a parent and she was so frustrated 
her child gets 15 minutes for lunch and 15 minutes of physical activity. That's it. Uh, and everything else is time on task to pass the MCAS, which doesn't mean a damn thing anyway. MCAS won't get you into college. So um, imagine hundreds, thousands of angry parents um, in my community saying, we're not gonna take this stuff anymore. We really want a different experience for our children. Um, that movement has a political edge to it, at least at a local level. Uh, if we can multiply that across um, the state, across uh, the nation, then maybe uh, we approach the tobacco um, uh, victories uh, in terms of food and uh, this obesity issue. So I think it is a political issue. Um, and it's as much a social justice issue as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, we actually did a study where we looked at the strength of school wellness policies across school districts in Connecticut. We have 159 school districts, and we found that one of the best predictors of the strength of the policy was the proportion of Democrats to Republicans in that school district. So it has become a Democrat-Republican thing, which, you know, Sometimes I think maybe that makes sense because sort of democratic ideology that we have more of a collective sense of responsibility that we need to think about, you know, sort of everyone as opposed to more individual responsibility and focusing on what, you know, sort of the individual f freedom and things like that. Um, but we really need to start coming up with ways to come together. And I was actually, you know, when the military report came out, I was thinking that that was a really nice thing <laughs> because, you know, now finally it feels like it's not just going to be this, you know, sort of polarized liberal versus conservative issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, I think politicians are keenly aware of number of votes as well as money they might receive from lobbyists. Well, uh, it might take a lot of time, but we really need to expedite the process. In order for, in order for us to do that, I think we need to really uh, take collective responsibility, as I indicated in my keynote speech, rather than personal responsibility, because you know, that is the key word they love, you know, lots of industrial people. Uh, and so uh, it just, it is, education or it is personal issue mm -hmm. you know that's the you know uh, the the line they always use but we have to acknowledge that uh, this is not just a personal thing there are lots of so many factors that are beyond the control of an individual and we should take collective responsibility and hopefully that awareness is shared as many constituents as possible so that Politicians are aware of the voice of the constituents and they need to move on to the right direction. Just to <coughs> make one more comment on this, if we look at other social movements and how long they've taken to really uh, gain the kind of traction that's resulted in societal change, this is fairly new. It's fairly recent that we have an uprising of data and energy and uh, collective interest in it, but we can't stop because we're at the moment now with a national leader, with a lot of data that's continuing to come out to support the argument with the obesity rates higher than they've ever been. The uh, sort of collision of all these things is happening right now. And for those of us who want to push it forward, we have to turn the heat up. And I think it's tempting to back away because it can be very strong, the political opposition, but we can't let it happen. So anyone who's willing to speak out, take action, try to create change has to do that now so we don't lose the momentum. But we're at the beginning of a social change movement. And I'd like to think in a decade or two from now, those obesity rates have gone back down and we have healthier environments that children are passing through on a daily basis. Another question? Yes, please. Well, thank you again for taking the time to speak with us. It's been great to hear your perspectives. Um, you've been mentioning a lot of uh, uh, concern over what children are eating, and I wanted to kind of bring it to what children are drinking. Um, Sugar-sweetened beverages and sodas constitute a main uh, source of calories for children and adults, and it's kind of kind of gets lost in the noise a little bit. I feel like, 
Um, and I'm coming from a tobacco perspective. Mm -hmm. And one of the most successful uh, techniques has been taxation. Mm -hmm. And so, as mentioned earlier, there's this talk about uh, a soda tax. And I kind of want to get your perspective on this soda tax specifically. Um, do you think it would be effective? Do you think that it could be a source of disparities, which has been an argument that's been made in the tobacco world? Do you think that this is a direction that we should be going in, or um, should we hold off on that? I, I can address that. Well, so I work with Kelly Brownell, who's probably one of the biggest advocates for the soda tax. Um, so I can certainly present the views of the Rudd Center. We have um, actually on our website a soda tax calculator where politicians can go in and put their district or their state or their city and find out how much revenue could be generated where they are by implementing a sugar sweetened beverage tax. Um, the you know our belief is that it will make a difference simply you know because of the tobacco experience and there's really you know people you know people from the soft drink industry feel like you're vilifying our product and you're blaming us well we've also done a meta-analysis looking at the research on sugar sweetened beverages and negative health outcomes and it's incontrovertible there it's absolutely the worst product out there and so to pick on it I think is completely justified and it's, you know, the, the main issue is that people drink those calories and, it, and they don't sort of register that they've had all those calories. And so they tend to just sort of pile on top. Um, so our research that we have done, and we've published some papers on this, is that it will have an effect. Um, it needs to be a pretty big tax. So a penny per ounce is the amount that we've been suggesting. And at that level, um, our estimates are that it will have an effect on consumption. The disparities argument is an interesting one, or you know that this would be regressive. And uh, our response to that is, you know, obesity is regressive. <laughs> that you know the people who are hurting the most in terms of the health consequences are um, tend to be low SES minority individuals. There's huge disparities in Connecticut in terms of our obesity rates by different ethnic groups. So our goal is that you know that if we can make changes there and decrease sugar sweetened beverage consumption. Um, you know, in the people who are consuming the most, then that, that's the best outcome of all. Let me give you some data uh, from the research. Uh, uh, a tax of one cent an ounce on sugar sweetened beverage, which will be about 10% price increase on 12 ounce can, would uh, reduce average per capita consumption by 8,000 calories annually potentially preventing about 2.3 pounds per year of weight gain. The uh, Dr. Thomas Frieden, the director of CDC Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, said a tax of one cent for on, uh, an ounce on sugar-sweetened beverage would be the single most effective measure to reverse the obesity epidemic. And I agree with him. I can add. <laughs> You're I not going to defend. I, 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 I second and third those <laughs> those comments. Thank you. Yeah. Mine's not so much a question. I just have to. I just need some help. Uh, I work for um, a nonprofit at several polls of Eastern Mass and Lynn. Our population is similar to Springfield. Uh, Forty percent in the that study of kids in first, fourth, seventh, and twelfth were overweight or obese. Um, but I have, I have a, a situation. We have an early intervention program. Uh, kids have to qualify for that. But we, we go into the homes of 1,000 people in Lynn every week. And um, there's 34,000 people in Massachusetts who are in early intervention. We have, a, we have a prenatal program. So we have, you're talking about, Dr. Robinson, you're talking about the preschool kids. Mm -hmm. there's, there's services out there for younger families. And I don't know where to start. We want to form a coalition with Early Head Start, with um, the preschools, the family daycares, who all have access to families all the time. In school, you see the teacher once a quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, they see you once a quarter. But when we're in people's homes where we see where they live and what they're eating, what they're doing in their culture, how do we start? So that's all I want to know is how, where do I start with getting this together so we can, I love, you, I love your idea of the preschools. I think that's where well, it starts. For, for, I mean, it's a, mixed population. Let me right. give you an example of what we did with oral health. We had an oral health initiative. So in Springfield or in Hamden County uh, six years ago when you look at the data, one in four children that were low income on mass health saw things. 
the next year it was one in five, so it was going backwards. Um, and, um, and we designed an intervention that occurs within the preschool setting. So students receive oral health care using portable dentistry. So what we had to do in Hanlon County because of the absence of dentists and the bias against serving low-income children, and in particular, serving children under the age of three. So don't care how much money you, you got. Dentists do not want to see those kids. So we developed an alternative delivery system to deliver oral health to them in a place uh, that uh, was easily accessible, safe, trusted by them and their families. So they get full comprehensive dental services in the preschool setting delivered by uh, a dentist. A dental team comes in, they open up, they deliver portable on-site dentist dentistry services. Alternative care system for poor kids that could not access the existing care system. That model uh, is adapted now in Springfield Public Schools and about 20 elementary schools, Westfield schools, uh, where, and they're serving children that don't have ready access. The problem is when you get to those that are zero to two, they're not in a center-based program. They are, in fact, in our case, 750 or 1,000 child care homes. The intervention had to change, so we spent our time, and I spent our time working with uh, pediatricians to do fluoride varnish treatments as a preventive measure. So that's how we get to those other kids. Now in this particular case, I think it's a little bit different. Um, so I'm, I've been kind of a little bit negative in some of my comments. So we have in our final preschool program, children that go home and tell their parents, I don't want to eat that because it's not in the groups. And the parents are coming back to the, coming back to the preschool <laughs> teachers. What, what are these groups? My <laughs> kids are talking, these are three-year-old kids now. What are these groups? And so the Farm the Preschool program um, builds capacity of the center-based providers uh, working specifically with the food um, directors uh, to take local, locally grown fresh produce into the classroom and prepare it for the children. We educate the providers. We have a system of collective buying where they actually save money, 35 to 40% savings when they buy collectively on, on, the, on the produce. Um, and we're beginning to change that culture. Uh, so the kids are experiencing it, they're carrying it home, parents are coming and asking about it. But the child care center itself is changing its uh, culture. Uh, they're, they're preparing foods differently, they're learning how to process foods. Uh, so it's a, it's a different um, uh, challenge. We're gonna get to those younger ones because it's from the preschool and families. So if those same preschool sites become points of distribution for food to families and or uh, centers for learning for families around food, then we think we'll reach the zero to two year olds that have children that are in the preschool. There's still a, a large population that we're gonna miss. So we're trying to connect this, um, create this system, food system if you will, again, another alternative system that will reach children that typically are um, outside of the uh, basic uh, care systems that, that are, are designed to serve them. Uh, they're not reaching them. We are constructing something new to get to, get to them. Uh, I can share some more information about that particular program, but we're having tremendous success. So we have 10 people that have been in a pilot for about a, about a year, year and a half. Those 10 organizations reach automatically 2,000 kids, and that program's not at scale. So our goal would be to get it right, get it tested, get it light size and all that other good stuff, and then take it to scale. So if we take it to scale in Springfield or in Hamden County, you're serving 7,000, 10,000, 15,000 kids, multiply that times four to the extent that you can connect families, then you have a program at scale serving a whole population of, of children. So that's our agenda. How far we, down that line we get, I'm not sure. We did it with oral health. I think we can do it with um, um, uh, food and fitness uh, uh, interventions, and that's our, that's our challenge and our, our strategy. We're taking the evidence and we're trying to translate it into uh, uh, practice in the field, and that's, uh, that's, big, that's a big challenge. If I may, uh, according to the weight gain trajectory study conducted by the National uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood <coughs> Institute on the NIH, uh, the accelerated weight gain was observed to begin at the age of 12. So it's critically important to intervene in the 
like 8 to 10 age range. And one of the interventions might be try to change the culture uh, that has made overeating socially acceptable and turn the food into a form of entertainment. And, you know, as uh, I, I was uh, born in South Korea, when I came to the United States, <coughs> I was shocked by the large portion size. When I came to Texas, I was even <laughs> surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I was stunned. So <laughs> you, you, re you really needed to cut down on the portion size. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing we desperately need are standardized uh, recommendations, regulations, and policies for child care facilities nationwide. State by state, there's variability. There's very little enforcement, especially when you get down to the home daycare small settings. So there's some nice movement in this area, and there are some publications out documenting what the standards could be, should be. And New York City is a very nice model where they've actually done it and they've published on it. And then for children between zero and three, it really is what's going on in the home for a lot of these kids who aren't in care. And we really have a lack of education for new parents in terms of introduction of food, uh, breastfeeding, which is a big piece of this that we haven't discussed tonight, support for that, and parent-child feeding dynamics. We don't talk about that in our culture. We don't appreciate how important they are in dictating what might happen in later years. And Parents really don't discuss that in a pediatric visit. There isn't time to do that. But there's a nice body of literature that actually shows if that's taken seriously and parents are the policy makers in the home and they understand what to do, it makes a big difference. And I think we're missing this piece in our society right now. Yes, please. Hi, um, my name is Megan and my colleague and I are here where relatively new and young <coughs> dietitians, and I hadn't heard any mention of dietitians today, so I was wondering, as someone who's very young and very passionate about what I'm doing and wants to get involved, where do you see we can fit in? Can we get involved in your preschool program? Can we, you know, make it mandatory that all school, school food service directors are dietitians registered by the United States? Can we have a dietitian in schools or in community centers? Um, so I just wanted to know if you had thought about that or um, if there's something currently going on with you guys. Great. I, go ahead. I, I have a response, although it's not might not be quite what you're looking for. But um, so I'm a psychologist. That's my background. People often think I have training in nutrition. I actually don't, although I did treat um, I patients. I, in <laughs> I did treat patients with eating disorders and obesity for a lot of years. So I, I learned a lot on the job um, and worked with a lot of dietitians. But here's something that might be controversial. There's something that I would love to see coming out of the American Dietetic Association and the field, which is there are two messages that I think have confused everyone. They are, there are no good foods or bad foods and everything in moderation. The problem with those messages is that they're, they're very hard for people to interpret, especially the moderation one. Technically, moderation is discretionary calories. Technically, that's about 200 calories a day for most of us and for small children. Nobody understands that. Parents don't understand that two cookies is all your child should have that's outside the groups for the day. And so I think if there would be a way to start being much more concrete with parents, even though it, it's going to be hard to take because people are going to say, oh, that feels so restrictive. Oh, are you sure I'm not going to cause an eating disorder because I'm not letting my child have more than two cookies? We need to reassure parents, no, your child will not get an eating disorder. They need to just learn what is normative. Now, back to the no good foods or bad foods, that's a favorite in the food industry because basically that means, you know, they're all off the hook, that no matter what the food is, that, you know, it can't be considered bad. Well, as I think I've made clear already, I happen to think there are some bad foods and some things that shouldn't even be considered food. If we could have some um, agreement on that in the in the you know dietitian feet in the dietetics field, then when we get to things like today's announcement um, in New York State is asking for 
permission to have SNAP, this, the um, food stamp program, not cover sugar-sweetened beverages. The USDA has always been vehemently against that because they don't like the idea of saying some foods are so bad that they shouldn't even be covered by SNAP. Well, this would be a great time for some dietitians to step forward and say, actually, we don't believe that sugar-sweetened beverages are supplemental nutrition for anyone, and we think it would be fine if those weren't covered by SNAP. So if you're looking for, um, uh, are you currently a student here? So, but if you're looking for a job, <laughs> come to Springfield. <laughs> so I was going to give you an internship, but come to Springfield for a job. Well, as I mentioned earlier, our I intervention in Springfield is multi-layered. So we, we try and ground ourselves as an intervention. So our farm and preschool is a way of demonstrating that we, we can do it. We have a complementary program called Fit Plus. And in that particular program, when we try and take that out of a single site and make it neighborhood level and move it into multiple sites, the one resource that Dr. Crystal Whitcock was looking for is a dietitian. It's, a, it's an instrumental um, um, uh, team player in that particular initiative. And, and what that program does is it works with uh, family groups in uh, a range of different settings. Um, preschool, early elementary age um, uh, families. So uh, there is an instrumental role in the um, uh, health education arena in terms of that type of intervention within our community. I know that within the WIC uh, um, uh, community, again, when we are looking for an expert or someone to help us, we, we go to WIC looking for some input around uh, a design or a, a strategy, and it's the WIC dietitian that we're pulling on. So I think there's, uh, uh, um, pivotal role in the work that we're doing, particularly at the intervention level. And I would, you know, that sort of matches the uh, policy um, opportunity in terms of SNAP. And I would just add to that, I'm sure you know the national meeting is here in Boston this November, which is terrific. And there probably needs to be changes in the training as well, because a lot of the training is focused on individual um, interaction, and that's clearly important when you're treating, but from a prevention perspective and everything that we're discussing, that knowledge of community-based strategies and policy interventions needs to be part of the training because we love having dietitians work with us, but they often come in with a mindset that it's one-on-one -on -one interaction and that's not the kind of work a lot of us are doing. And in addition to that, publishing in the journals that dietitians subscribe to and read is really important because this message and this type of research has to get out there and be read on a regular basis. And CMEs are also a, a, a good way to expose everyone to that. So it's, it's a shift in the field that needs to be consistent with the shift in how we're gonna solve some of our societal problems. Hi, thanks again for coming to speak with us. It's been a great night. Um, uh, my name is John Skinner. I work for Corporate Accountability International downtown here. We're a nonprofit campaign organization. And one of the things we've looked at a lot in the food industry is the effect of marketing, especially on children, especially from the fast food and junk food industry. So I was hoping if you could just speak of um, your experiences about the effects of marketing and if it's a bad thing, what's the best thing we can do to stop it and try and turn it around? Thank you. Well, marketing is very effective. Um, we've <laughs> done, uh, let's see, a few studies um, that have been published that where we found that when people watch television shows, and this is both uh, young ch children as well as adults, college students, that if you watch a TV show that has food commercials embedded in it versus the same show with other types of commercials, non-food commercials, you are more likely to eat more of the food that's in front of you, even if it's not the food that's being advertised. So the problem with food marketing is not just that it might, you know, sort of for children imprint them on brands like, you know, Frosted Flakes and Tony the Tiger, but that it also seems to trigger eating. So this whole idea of sitting in front of the TV with, with a snack is pretty dangerous because those commercials do mm. seem to set that up. Um, you know, we, we really, our position is that there should be no food marketing to children at all. Um, and, and one sort of getting back to the parents that we were talking about, the parents of the young children, I think a lot of the marketing is also directed at those parents. And 
I think that parents have been convinced that there are kids' foods, and there's only certain foods that kids would eat, and there, you know, it comes in a box with a big smile on it, or it has a character. And in some ways, we also need to, you know, get those parents to, to stop believing those commercials, because I think that the effectiveness of that on parents and sort of convincing parents that these foods are appropriate for children is another huge problem. Well, let me share one data. Uh, according to uh, economic projection study, eliminating exposed to food advertising on TV will reduce obesity prevalence among United States children ages 6 to 12 by 15 percent. Huge. So I do think as I uh, indicated in my keynote speech, we should eliminate Children's exposed to food advertising on television, like uh, you know, they have done successfully in Sweden and Norway. Uh, and that's really uh, that will really make a big difference. Um, hi, my name is Mackenzie, and one of the reasons I was really excited to see the subject on um, the discussion list was something that I had been thinking about for quite some time. I saw a uh, juicy juice commercial and their tagline was the best juice for the best kids. And I started thinking about kind of how for all the kids that are seeing that commercial and aren't having juicy juice because they can't afford that kind of juice, like the implied messages there. So my question is, um, you know, connecting, it sounds like your work with racism and segregation. I just wonder if you've seen any kind of secular um, implications with that, if you see kids giving you any type of feedback that they're kind of internalizing, you know, negative messages based on what is available to them, or if that's something that you're not really noticing. I'm not sure I can give you, uh, uh, you know, a really good on the point response to that in terms of the, the, um, um, that message. Um, I would suspect, you know, this is just off the top now. I suspect they're getting juicy juices. They're getting all of that same stuff. There's, there's no barrier to their access to that stuff. They're going to get it um, at some level um, because they see it, they want it, they're going to have the same desires. Um, they may not get as much of it, but it's, it's going to be available to them. So I, I don't know that this is that kind of one-to-one -one, um, uh, connection. I know that, th you know, in a more macro sense, that the, the communities within which um, these children live, uh, in not all communities, but in some communities, they, they, they may have no other choice but juicy juice. So when you walk into the corner store, if you don't have a, a proper or an appropriate array of alternative foodstuffs, you may just have something that is popular, attractive, and moves quickly and easily. So again, they may have more of it, not less of it. And I, I know that Frank talked about this, but we're, we're only beginning to understand sort of the degree to which culture really has sort of some defining um, qualities here. When we're, we're working in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is a huge refugee resettlement area in New England, also Lewiston, Maine, and the Bangor area. And there are young parents there who are from um, countries where their diets are actually pretty good, but they get here and they want their kids to be American and they want their kids to eat American food. And so there's this sense of giving up what they have and actually you know, seeking what we would consider to be, and I would agree, are bad foods because this is how they show that their kids are be American. Yeah, I would agree. I have some research going on as well with new immigrants, and marketing is extremely powerful. And it's leading people to believe that to be successful here, you need to behave like the ads are showing us. And it's unfortunate because they're being led toward the less healthy products, and it's targeted marketing in a lot of ways. In terms of marketing, um, I had a really interesting, my husband works for an international marketing group. He's not a marketeer. Um, he's an attorney. <laughs> and brought me some studies that came out of England about a group of their sort of sister agencies in England who um, uh, the food companies had gone to them and said, you know, we've got this stuff and, you know, it's kind of not 
you know, we know what it is, but we need to sell it, and we want you to help us sell it. So they looked at the stuff, and they looked at what was going on. They basically went back to the client and said, you know, you guys have to fix this, because if you don't fix it, the government's going to come after you because they pay for the health care in this country. And it was really an interesting sort of complete turnaround in how, you know, they essentially said, you know, we're, we're not going to work with you because – we can't help you. You have to fix the product or else, you know, the government's going to make you do it. Mm. Karen, you just made me think about something I hadn't considered much <laughs> recently. Um, I'm a physician, and for decades, you know, since I was a student, we were taught so much about how much culture influenced what we saw in our patients. So in the 1970s, I learned that Latinas were obese and ate rice, and that African-American women were obese and ate fried chicken. As we talk about culture now, one of the things that concerns me is that we remember that context in a certain way creates culture mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that people oftentimes live out the options that they have. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep a really honest conversation about this that addresses the disparities in obesity that were in existence before people were willing to admit that there was an obesity epidemic? Mm -hmm. And I'll listen to what you want to say about that. I think, it's, I think it's as hard as what we think we're trying to have in this country these days, a, a discussion about race. And I think the disparities issue is profound, and I also think that a number of these communities have such other profound issues around violence and around poverty and jobs that it's very difficult to raise food to the, to the level at which it needs to be discussed. But I do think there's a group of younger uh, people of color um, in this country who are beginning to see this food issue and, and again, safe parks, safe streets as a, uh, as a real um, environmental justice issue. And, you know, Will Allen is greening Milwaukee, and there's a woman whose name I can't remember who's taken a whole swath of the South Bronx and created a park, and she's also now training people to do sort of green jobs in that neighborhood. And I, I do think that trying to lift up the voices of those leaders particularly, um, and, you know, we have them in Boston as well. They often get silenced because of the violence issues in a number of our neighborhoods. But I do think that's, you know, part of what I know um, the Boston uh, Coalition for Food and Fitness is trying to do. And it's just beginning to emerge. But I do think that it's probably one of the most – um, profound um, civil rights issues that we have left to solve in this country, and it gets directly tied to poverty. Mm -hmm. I had the, um, the um, occasion this month to hear a couple of people present. Uh, 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 Dr. Gail Christopher, Kellogg Foundation presented, um, and a uh, guy, Tim Wise, never heard of him before, uh, talked of, and they both were presenting on the issue of race and health. And they both said the same thing in different ways. They said that racism is a belief system, and that we no matter who you are, black, white, or indifferent, uh, that it, it filters as part of your worldview, and that it's a screen or a lens through which you make decisions every day. Even, even if you don't want to, it's, it's part of your fabric. And um, um, Tim Wise suggested that what we need to do is consciousness training. And so it's, it's not that you're a bad person because you have this lens, it's because you grew up here, you got this lens. And so if you are particular around the lens, and if you consciously think about it in decision making, then you have a way of self-correcting and nullifying that, that experience so that, so that your racism or the self, um, the internalized view of race that you were practicing as a physician um, uh, was because you grew up in this country. Um, so you need consciousness training, or did, or I do, in that sense, as, as do folks in the audience as you make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was r powerful conversations around not just that topic or that instance, but multiple um, situations, um, uh, basic decision-making and how 
again, that lens interferes with our ability to do the right thing. So just one comment on that. You know, being an academic, I have the privilege of working with 18 to 30-year-olds often, and they're ready to make change and take on the world. And I think there are a lot of young people who are wanting to see things differently, who are wanting to make change, who are ready for a different country. And we have to lift those voices up and embrace the messages that they're trying to bring to a lot of people who've been living longer than them. And it's our responsibility to support them through that journey. And um, we're probably surrounded by people in the room tonight who fit in that category. So I think we will um, end now, unless there are other questions. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Amy. And uh, I have a question about, um, a follow-up question about marketing food to children. Uh, two Sundays ago, there was a New York Times Magazine article about carrot sticks that are being marketed oh, in yeah. junk food packaging uh, mm. in schools, I think, is where they've started, in vending machines. And I wondered, uh, especially based on what you said about marketing food at all to children, um, what your reactions were to that. Were you horrified? Did you think it was really clever and innovative? Um, great yeah. question. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I've been struggling with that because prior to this, uh, Nickelodeon had licensed some of its characters for like SpongeBob, Carrot Sticks, and Dora the Explorer, Clementines, and and I, I didn't like it at all. You know, I just felt like I wanted to go to the grocery store and not see SpongeBob and not see Dora the Explorer. But the, I did look at, because I got asked my opinion, I, and I did go on the website and look at the campaign for the carrots, and you know, it was impressive. You know, I have to say, whoever put it together seemed to be of the same caliber as the people who are, you know, marketing Cheetos and Doritos. So I guess, you know, I, I basically feel like maybe we just need to meet people where they are right now. And maybe right now, the only way to kind of break through um, you know, trying to get kids to eat the healthier food is to, you know, use the same tactics as, you know, the other side does. Eventually, I'd like to get to the point where parents are making the decisions and the food marketers are not the ones speaking to the children. But I just think that, you know, it may be that we need to go through this process first. Um, and I also have to, again, acknowledge uh, that the, the food industry has been asked now for a while to use their sort of powers of marketing for good instead of for the unhealthy foods. And so, you know, I have to say, I think this is an effort to do that. And so I, I feel like it's an empirical question. We'll wait, we'll see how it works and how effective it is. On the other side of the equation, you know, there's the same um, conflict that a lot of us have with technology and physical activity. So should we support the we at Active Games, which are expending calories for kids and meeting them where they are, and that these kids were raised with technology? Or do we say, we're not buying it, we're not supporting it, you need to go outside and play tag? So I feel like it's the same battle that I face on that side of the equation as well. And if you talk to kids, you know, their preference would be probably to have a fancier package with carrots and have a, a game that uh, has technology associated with it. So. What do we do with that? It's, a, it's, it's an interesting dilemma. So I want to thank everyone so much. This was a fascinating evening. Um, someone who works in the field, I feel like I learned so much. And uh, for me, there were really kind of six areas that came out as drivers tonight. And um, didn't surprise me because there are so many different drivers in this problem. But the ones that really came out that we discussed a lot were food access, racism and socioeconomic disparities, uh, marketing food to children, sugar sweetened beverage consumption, school food quality and time to consume it, and culture and societal change. And I think if you think about those as the drivers, you know, some of those we really can do something about through enacting laws and policy and working with uh, specific organizations to actually implement change. Some of it will take time to see the drift, but some of it really is in our power to change right away. It's just how we decide to prioritize, spend our money, and vote in this country. So I want to thank everyone very much, and um, I hope you had an enjoyable evening.